So I want to go back to really where we began the day, and I want to try to put dis today's discussion in a bigger picture of uh, a global picture about cities and Barcelona's unique role in the global family of cities. Um, when I last spoke at a conference of Barcelona Global, it was on the 13th of December in the Hospital de San Pau, and I tried to talk to you about other cities that had faced crises and how they had reacted to the crises. Some of you will remember I said that Montreal and Milan had taken much too long to come out of their crises, whereas if you look at New York and Hong Kong and London and Berlin and Miami, they found a way out of the crisis. I want to tell you that I think that Barcelona's approach to tackling the crisis needs to learn a little bit from what some of those cities have done. Most of those cities before the crisis happened had underlying problems that had never been addressed. The underlying problem of unaffordable housing or the underlying problem of a weak labor market or the underlying problem of social exclusion. And these crises made those underlying problems more visible, deeper, more challenging. And in some cases, certain groups of people were blamed for the crisis, even though what the crisis had done was to reveal something else. So I feel in a certain way, the challenge we're in in Barcelona is that one of the groups of people that is being blamed for the underlying problems that the city already had are the tourists. And I think this is a kind of populism, to find a group of people and to blame them, rather than to ask the question, how ready were we in this city? for the challenge that we faced when the challenge came. So Barcelona's crisis is not a crisis of an environmental catastrophe. There has, of course, been a terrorist attack. There has, of course, been a change in the atmosphere of the city. But it's fundamentally a challenge made by politics. It's a crisis of confusion of identity confusion of aspiration. It's a crisis of political conflict, of genuinely held different opinions about the future. It's a challenge of reputation and reputation management and the images that are associated with the city and have been associated because of the political crisis and its nature. But the point I want to make is that all of these crises have an impact on tourism. That's why we have heard of the numbers of visitors who are down in Barcelona, the numbers of congresses with fewer delegates, the numbers of fewer customers in the restaurants, and we've heard, of course, the challenges about the fiscal relocation of many of the companies. But in each case, in each of these cities, where there has been a successful way out of the crisis, Tourism has played an important part. Tourism has been part of the path out of crisis. Tourism has been a way to reintroduce the city to the world, to bring new audiences, to change the perceptions, to build a new relationship. And so it's obvious to me that tourism is part of the way for Barcelona to get out of the crisis that you have experienced, this reputational political crisis, this crisis of confusion, but it will have to be a new deal for tourism. You know, it's very clear for anyone who studies Barcelona that Barcelona proceeds well when there is a social contract that underlies a new deal that creates new opportunities. This was the promise of 
1974 and the 78 Constitution and the 92 Olympics and the promise that Barcelona provided to the Catalan people many times in the history was a new opportunity underpinned by a new social contract. And so I want to come back to this in a few minutes. But first I want to paint a bigger picture in all of this. Now it's very easy to look at maps of the world's cities and to see different versions of which are the cities in the world that matter, which are the important ones. Now there's a little bit of my picture is missing here, but it doesn't matter. Which are the important cities and how do they work and uh, which ones should we be thinking about? In this model of the world cities, we look at the 50, 60 or 70 most important cities in the world. To think about this in a certain way, something unites all of these cities. The attempt to have a competitive economy that creates jobs, how to maintain a good or a high quality of life, including good public services, and how, as doing that, to have an authentic or unique character or identity for the city. And the closer you go to the center of this chart, the nearer you get to the cities that have the most diversified economies, the best paying jobs, the biggest tax base, and the most resilient brands. In the center of this map, with New York and Hong Kong and London and Paris, you see the cities whose brands are almost unbreakable. The further out you go in this map, you see cities where the mix of jobs is a little bit less diverse. The high paying wages are a little bit less there. The brands of the cities, while they communicate something unique and specific, they're not necessarily brands that are resilient. So if you're on the outside edge of this, it really matters that you pay attention to brand to reputation, to performance, to quality, and those things, because that is the way to move closer to the middle. Now, in the center of this picture, we have these established world cities, Hong Kong and New York and London and Paris and Tokyo and Singapore and Seoul, the cities with the best paying jobs, the most diversified economies, the most resilient brand platforms, and lots of problems. Lots of problems to do with affordability, to do with infrastructure, to do with land uses, lots of challenges to do with inequality. But essentially, we have cities that if they can fix these social challenges, the economic engine is there for a long time to come. These cities will still be the top cities in the world in 50 years' time, probably. In the next ring around them, you see the contenders, cities that are trying to become like those cities. Here you see Madrid, by the way, trying to become one of those cities, trying to mix the diversified economy, the corporates, the SMEs, the different sectors, the institutions with the high quality of life, the regional infrastructure platforms, doing very well. And on the right-hand side, you see a whole group of cities in the emerging world that are striving to have the quality needed to be really strong cities that have that diverse economy and those leading roles in the global economy. You see Shanghai and Dubai and Sao Paulo and Mumbai, these great cities of 10, 15, 20, 25 million people building their city almost for the first cycle of globalization or a new cycle of globalization for them. On the left-hand side, we see what I'm calling for these purposes the new world cities. This is a very, very interesting group of cities where you will see, of course, not just Tel Aviv and Austin and, of course, Miami and Amsterdam that we spoke about today, but you also find Barcelona. What characterizes these cities? Very high quality of life, connected to wonderful natural assets, beaches, mountains, rivers, lakes, places where people want to be, combined with an authentic culture, a character, an identity that is known, 
and the ability to put those things together with a well-managed metropolitan area, with good public services, great infrastructure, good planning, and the ability to specialize in a small number of economic sectors with very high value added, usually driven by knowledge and technology usually therefore to do with creativity and design, or to do with medicine and life sciences, or to do with digital technologies, or to do with earth sciences or environmental sciences. These cities have a very special promise. The promise is we will stay small. We'll stay below five million. We'll stay manageable. We'll stay local. We'll continue to have this feeling of being Miami or Amsterdam or Barcelona, and at the same time, we offer you the opportunities of a global career in high-value industries that will provide you with the passport into the global economy through our brilliant universities, and we offer you these two things together. Very high quality of life, with global reach, global identity, and specialization. These are the new world cities. And every single one of them is different and unique and distinctive. And what is obvious about all of these cities is that they need tourism. Tourism is part of the strategy that introduces them to the world. It's part of the strategy that gives them the connectivity to underpin the global sectors. Tourism is part of what makes them hospitable and provides them with the wonderful hotels, the fantastic convention centers, the superb restaurants, the nightlife, the entertainment. Tourism is part of the fuel that drives the investment in the cultural amenities, the assets, the identity. Tourism is part of becoming a global city. And we'll come back to this in a minute. Now, what that means, of course, for Barcelona is that this is a kind of three-dimensional game of chess. Every city on this map is trying to move incrementally closer to the center, closer to the point where the brand becomes completely resilient, the economy becomes superbly diverse, the range of jobs, the average income rises, the tax base becomes bigger, the ability to invest in services and in public goods is increased. Every city is trying to move in that direction. And the thing is, you can't move towards that center unless you have some version of responsible tourism in your city. There's no city on this map moving towards the center that is not trying to have very high quality, responsible, successful tourism. I want to come back to this in a minute because I think the competitive dimension of this conversation is very important for Barcelona to understand. It's not just enough for Barcelona to recover its social consensus. There has to be a new, deeper social consensus about the kind of city we're trying to become and how we build the management model that allows us to manage the opportunities and the risks and the challenges of moving further towards that more diverse, more resilient economy. Now, technology is usually uh, a helper in this regard. Um, by the way, I'd just like to say to people, we have the wrong version of my slides here. We have the version of th a week ago, not the current version. I don't know if it's possible to change that because we're now missing some slides. If there's something we can do, that would be great. Uh, but I'm going to carry on, and uh, we might come back to them. Anna, if there's something we could do, it would be good, because we're missing all the slides on the new urban economy right now. So, no successful cities exist in, according to this approach that don't have tourism. Think about Singapore, Tokyo, San Francisco, Boston, all of the cities that have done very well in this global system. These are cities where tourism is extremely important and where tourism has made a very big difference to how they work. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the special benefits of tourism. 
Tourism brings to these cities connectivity, it brings important amenities, it brings a kind of cosmopolitanism, talent, attraction, and jobs. It brings affinity, affiliation, reputation, identity. Tourism makes a city visible, open, accessible, and hospitable. Those are things that no city can afford to be without. Tourism is also a kind of act of self-confidence. It's an opportunity to tell the world who we are, show our DNA, and it means, if you like, a kind of free advertising for everything that's great about the city. So for Barcelona, as you try to move through this three-dimensional game of chess towards the center uh, of this board, a new cycle of responsible tourism is going to be required. Now, let me tell you very briefly the story of Hong Kong, only because I think this story is particularly relevant for you. The crisis in Hong Kong in 97, 98, and 2002 was firstly the crisis of leaving uh, the British Empire and going back into the Chinese Empire, if you want to think of it that way. It's the crisis of one country, two systems, a kind of reverse version of um, independence, if you like, being taken over by a powerful uh, country. The Asian financial crisis of 98, and then the SARS crisis of 2002, where people were essentially told, if you go to Hong Kong, you might die with SARS. So Hong Kong experienced something a little bit like Barcelona, not an environmental catastrophe, not in fact a military conflict, even though you might have thought that, but a conflict of reputation, a conflict of idea, a conflict of the image of the city of Hong Kong that was seen all over the world, plus big doubts about whether the new arrangements could work or not. And so what Hong Kong did I think very cleverly, was to go back to the idea of what is the DNA of Hong Kong. Hong Kong was built as a port city, a trading city, an enterprise hub, a place that was designed to facilitate trade between East and West, a place which was always designed to be English-speaking and Chinese-speaking, to be Cantonese and to be Mandarin and to be English, a kind of trilingual trading port. And what Hong Kong did was essentially to persuade China that the way out of the SARS crisis was to be more Hong Kong and to demonstrate that being more Hong Kong would be good for China. So we saw, even with the use of famous ambassadors like Jackie Chan, right? This is the man. This is Mr. Hong Kong, that using ambassadors to promote a new sense of welcome, a new desire to have um, uh, tourists there again, and to use the business community as leaders in fostering a proposition that said, Hong Kong is good for China, Hong Kong works well when it lives by its DNA. Let us provide the Chinese people with their first experience of the outside world. Let us make it easy for Chinese people to visit Hong Kong, and let's allow Hong Kong to take its place in the new family of Chinese cities as this particular kind of entrepô going back to the DNA of being a trading and an entrepreneurial city. Now, Hong Kong was very successful, and as you know, in the last 16 years, it has re-emerged as a great global city, and it has taken its place in the Chinese system of thinking as complementary to Shanghai and Beijing, a city that does things that other parts of China can't do, and Hong Kong's entrepreneurial spirit is being used now much more to help build cities in China, to finance Chinese companies, to promote Chinese technology. China has realized it needs Hong Kong to be Hong Kong. It doesn't need Hong Kong to be China. And this is a very important insight. So what do we learn from that? 
that self-confidence is a very important part of this, and the more self-confident we are, the more that can be based on, uh, that can provide a basis for experimentation. And today we've talked a lot about experimentation. When you listen to Carl and Didi and uh, Julie May and Hirte, you heard, I think, lots of examples of cities experimenting. Experimenting with public space, experimenting with new rules, experimenting with taxes, experimenting with new events, experimenting with changing the rules, experimenting with times of year. A spirit of experimentation emerges from self-confidence and that provides the basic ecosystem for innovation. This spirit of self-confidence also helps us to tell a story differently. It allows us to see the story of the city as having very particular chapters, helps us to see the chapter that we're in, to think about the chapters that have been before and the chapter that is yet to come. It allows us to anticipate the next chapter and to think about it. And maybe with this crisis, Barcelona has come to the natural end of a chapter. And so the question is, what's the next chapter really going to be about? And part of the task we face is to start to tell that story in a very particular way. Let's just look for a minute at what Singapore and Tel Aviv did. Singapore has an obvious story in chapters. Singapore in 1964 became an independent country, decided not to rejoin Malaysia, was an island all on its own, impoverished, and it decided Firstly, to fix its water, its health, and its housing and education problems, and to do that by earning its money as a low-cost production location. And for a whole cycle, made in Singapore was the way we got our cheap goods in Europe. You may remember them. And then they realized that the, the value created from this manufacturing could be reinvested in technology and science, and another chapter began in about 1988 that was all about science and technology. And as that chapter did very well and they began to earn money in that way, then another chapter began where they moved into a knowledge economy, advanced services, and that chapter has been going on at least since 1998 or 2000 with Singapore growing its role. And now, of course, Singapore is investing its excess capital in nanotechnologies, in new kinds of uh, geophysical technologies, material sciences, and everything else. It's a perfect lesson in how to use the different chapters of the story to create a narrative that allows a city to move from the outside of my chart right into the center of the chart. And we see the same thing, of course, uh, with Tel Aviv and with Brisbane. And you see here with Barcelona, in a way, Tourism was the thing that began in 1992 with the Olympics. It allowed you to really get into urban tourism rather than just seaside tourism for the first time. And it did have the effect of creating the opportunity for create, uh, creativity, design, and enterprise, and then to get into exports and technology and students. It's just that the tourism also continued and eventually began, I think, to take over uh, many of the activities that began to crowd out some of the aspects of the next story, at least in terms of the image and identity that was created. So the point here is to know the story. If the first part is to know the DNA, the second part is to know the chapter we've been in, what was that chapter and which chapter comes next? Now, other cities have had to learn this, and I'm not going to tell you the stories of all of these. But I think it's very important to understand that these cities know how to describe what is their next chapter. And they know what have been the previous chapters and which mixes and elements, and they know the road towards the more resilient, stronger brand, more diversified, higher income earning, higher tax economy, which is going to enable them to continue to be resilient and sustainable into the future. So 
What did we hear today that's useful for this story? Well, we heard in theme one about managing and diversification of locations, Carl Weisbrod talked to us a huge amount about New York's approach, both to better managing the locations that it had, bringing Times Square and 42nd Street back to life, and then we heard about the diversification of locations around New York, and we heard about how the, the attempts being made to spread tourists around to create in the outer boroughs of New York these new locations. In other words, to manage tourism at the same time as New York was becoming a more diverse city economically with a bigger spread of population. And you heard, I think, that the action plan for Barcelona here, of course, is to create this new commission to work on the redevelopment, the bringing back of the parallel, to create that as a new corridor, an exciting development for Barcelona, to have this uh, commission for the redevelopment of, uh, of locations that are underperforming, and to focus attention particularly on Las Ramblas, and to think about how they can re-emerge with a strong focus on quality and on championing uh, these new locations to do better. When Didi talked to us about Miami, she talked about this very challenging problem of having the wrong kind of tourism. And as she said very memorably, uh, if you don't go to try and get what you want, you're going to get what you get. And she told us, I think, very persuasively about the low-value tourism and how they went for the Art Basel proposition in an attempt to upgrade their tourism and at the same time create something that would be good for residents, thus raising quality of life as well as raising their tourism offer. And you heard all about how that had worked. And then you heard this fabulous proposition uh, that Juan and others put together about Barcelona as a city of music and the six different elements of the strategy and how that could work, not just again to bring about an improvement in tourism, but to make more Barcelona, to make the city more livable and more attractive for everyone who's here. Then I think you heard, when we looked at the next two, Julie May talked to you about Cape Town and its absolute commitment to translate tourism into local benefits for people. You heard about the procurement and the contracts, the small businesses, the quality of jobs, the investment in people, the progression routes that they were enjoying. You heard about the investment in community organizations. You heard about the alignment of tourism with the economy of the city. And you heard about the reinvestment in places through the city improvement districts. And then you heard, of course, when we talk about Barcelona in this regard, this strong focus that there's going to be on uh, really building up Barcelona's approach to equality. When uh, Pau talked to us, he talked about employment in the tourism sector. He talked about women and men earning the same money. He talked about living wages for people who work in tourism and building, as it were, a proposition around him being employed by tourism that would be the basis for a new social contract. He also spoke about the importance of using the tourism tax in, in a way that makes it more visible, and possibly he made the, you know, the boldest proposition of the day that the tourism tax should be increased for the purposes of making these investments and making it clear. Then you heard from Gierte Udo the fantastic story of Amsterdam and the way that the uh, strategy to change behaviors of tourists and to spread and diversify the locations, to use marketing tools to communicate the city, and then to use all of these digital tools to make the city smarter in the way it enforces the rules and make the city smarter in the way it organizes tourism so that people behave very well. And you heard uh, indeed from, uh, uh, fr from Michael uh, and from others about the approach that you want to use here to create a much stronger data platform to manage uh, all of this in Barcelona and to move forward with a new approach to how you regulate um, the, the, the market for using uh, private homes uh, for tourism purposes. You heard very clearly uh, what is intended there. 
So I think in a way, what has come from this conversation for me is the ingredients required to build that new deal for tourism in Barcelona, the new social contract. This will require a, a very important conversation with the city government to start to see how the vision of sustainable tourism and this view of more responsible tourism can be integrated. And it will also require, I think, uh, the opportunity to experiment with some of these things to see if they can work, rather than to regulate in or regulate out or legislate in or out which ones are allowed. So coming really to the final points. Ah, oh, that's not the final slide that I remember. Here's the final slide. So it's very clear from all of this, I think, that great cities need responsible tourism. As I said a few minutes ago, there's no great city that doesn't have a tourism sector. Tourism is an absolutely key ingredient. And it creates that global reach, that identity, that accessibility, visibility, it creates those assets that cities need. But responsible tourism needs leadership. And we've seen a lot of leadership in this room today, and I commend and congratulate the leading members of Barcelona Global for the leadership they have taken. It will also need proactive and capable leadership in the city government, in Turisme de Barcelona. It will require a proactive leadership from the Generalitat and from others. But I believe that a coalition could be built around this new idea of responsible tourism. Leadership, as you know, requires confidence. And I've made the point that you can be confident that by pursuing an agenda of responsible tourism, you will do the things necessary to be a successful international city in other ways. And that confidence also means knowing what really is Barcelona. And this last panel that discussed in such great eloquent detail what really is Barcelona gave you, I think, what you need there. This jubilant, enterprising, self-determining city, this city that is not shy, is not easily put off, but this city that wants to be sure that when something is agreed, it benefits everyone. And when everyone benefits, then everyone participates, is part of the deal here. And that's the thing, I think, the DNA of Barcelona, this socially-based contract model that will allow you to take into interventions, innovations, and create this sort of new license to operate. So my last line is really to tell you, as we said at the start of the day, that the whole purpose of this has been to recognize that tourism is not something that you can simply abolish. Tourism needs to be part of the city, but we need a new cycle of responsible tourism. And there is no better place in the world to invent new tools than in Barcelona. This is what Barcelona is for. It's an inventive city that makes new ways of being a city every time it tries to be itself. So I think the world expects Barcelona to innovate in this space, to teach and to learn with others in a way that is uh, creative and a way that is fruitful. So if I can summarize this, I think my message is to uh, be Barcelona. And if you're willing to be Barcelona in the real deep way that Barcelona can be Barcelona, I think a new cycle of responsible tourism will begin.